It's four o'clock, so let's time. Let's look at our preview. At our, sorry, now our next talk. I have been doing some mad things in Go, but building a database, I honestly have strong respect for. So next up is Etienne, who's going to tell us everything about crazy journeys in Go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to our mad journey of building a database in Go. And um, yeah. It's pretty mad to build a database at all. It may be even worse or even uh, madder to build a database uh, um, in Go when most are built in. Okay, closer. Okay. Okay, cool. Let, let me start over in case you didn't hear it. So, hi, my name is Etienne. Welcome to our mad journey of building a vector database in Go. So, building a database at all could already be pretty mad. Uh, doing it in Go when most are built in C or C. Could be even even matter or even more exciting, and we definitely encountered a couple of unique problems that led us to create uh, creative solutions. And there's lots of shouts out in there, and also a couple of wish lists. So we just released Go 1.20, um, and of course the occasional uh, madness. So let's get one question out of the way right away. Why does the world even need yet another da database? There's so many out there already, but. Probably you've seen this thing called ChatGPT, because that was, that was pretty much everywhere and it's kind of hard to, to hide from it. And uh, ChatGPT is a large language model and it's, it's really good at putting text together that sounds really sophisticated and, and sounds nice and sometimes is completely wrong. Um, and, and so in, in this case we're asking it, is it mad to write a database and go, I might disagree with that. Um, but either way, basically, we're now in a situation where on the one hand, we have these machine learning models that can do all the cool stuff and do this sort of interactively and on the fly. And on the other side, we have traditional databases. And those traditional databases, they have the facts because that's kind of what databases are for, right? So wouldn't it be cool if we could somehow combine those two? So for example, on the query side, if I ask Wikipedia, why can airplanes fly? Then the kind of passage that I want that has the answer in it is titled The Physics of Flight. But that is difficult for a traditional search engine because if you look at keyword overlap, there's, there's almost none in there. Um, but a, a, a vector search engine can use machine learning models basically that can tell you these two things are the same and searching through that at scale is a big problem. Then there's that sort of chat GPT uh, side where you don't just want to search through it but maybe you also want to say like take those results summarize them and also translate them to German. So basically not just return exactly what's in the database, but do something with it and basically generate uh, more data from it. And that is exactly where VV8 comes in. So VV8 is a vector search engine which basically helps us solve this, this kind of searching by meaning instead of keywords without uh, sort of losing what we've done in 20 plus years of uh, search engine uh, research. And now, most recently, you can also interact with um, these models such as ChatGPT, GPT-3, and of course also the, the open source uh, versions of it. So BV8 is written in Go. Is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? Or have we just gone plain mad? So we're not alone. That's good. So you probably probably recognize these things. They're, they're all uh, bigger brands at the moment than BV8, but BV8 is growing fast. Um, and uh, some of those vendors have really great uh, blog posts where you see some of the like optimization topics and some of the crazy stuff that they had to do. So if you've contributed to, to one of those, some of the things I'm going to say might sound familiar. Um, if not, then uh, buckle up, it's going to get mad. So first stop on our mad journey, memory allocations, and that also brings us to our friend, the, the garbage collector. So for any high performance Go application, sooner or later, you're going to talk about memory allocations. And I definitely consider a database a high performance application, or at least I consider VV8 a high performance application. And if you think of what databases do, like in essence, basically, you have something on disk and you want to serve it to the user. That's like one of the, the most important user journeys in uh, a database. And here, this is represented by just a number. So I went for uint32. So that's just four bytes on disk. And uh, basically, you can see sort of these four bytes. If you parse them into Go, they would have the value of 16 in that UN32. And this is essentially something, very much simplified, that a database needs to do, and it needs to do it over and over again. So the standard library gives us the encoding slash binary package. And there we have this binary.read method, with, which I think looks really cool. It, it, to me, it looks like idiomatic Go, because it has the, the io.reader interface, like everyone's favorite interface. And you can put all of that stuff in there. 
And uh, if you run this code and there's no error, then basically you get exactly what you want. You could turn those sort of four bytes that were somewhere on disk, uh, turn them into um, our in-memory representation of that UN32. So is this a good idea to do that exactly like that? Well, if you do it once or maybe twice, could be a good idea. If you do it a billion times, this is what happens. So for those of you who are new to, to CPU profiles in Go, this is madness. This is pretty bad. So first of all, you see it in the center. Um, parsing those one billion numbers took 26 seconds. And 26 seconds is not the kind of time that we ever have in a database. But worse than that, if you look at that profile, um, we have stuff like runtime m alloc gc, runtime mem move, runtime m advice. So all these things, they're related to memory allocations or to garbage collection. What they're not related to is parsing data, which is what we wanted to do, right? So how much time of that 20 seconds did we spend what we wanted to do? Don't know, it doesn't even show up in the profile. So and to understand why that is the case, we need to quickly talk about the stack and the heap. So you can think of the stack as basically your function stack. So you call one function that calls another function. And then at some point, basically, you go back through the stack. And uh, this is very short-lived. And this is cheap and fast to allocate. And why is it cheap? Because you know exactly the runtime of your variables or the life cycle of your variables. So you don't even need to involve the garbage collector. So no garbage collector, cheap and fast. Then on the other side, you have the heap. And the heap is basically this, this sort of long-lived kind of memory. And that's expensive and slow to allocate. And why? because, and, and also to deallocate, uh, why? Because it involves the garbage collector. So if the stack is so much cheaper, then we can just always allocate on the stack, right? So warning, this is not real Go. Please, please do not do this. Um, this is sort of a fictional example of allocating a buffer of size eight, and then we're gonna say like, yeah, please put this on the stack. Uh, and that is not how it works. And for most of you, you probably say like, this is pretty good that it's not that, that it works that way because why would you want to deal with that? But for me, just trying to build a database in Go, so yeah, sometimes like this, 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 something like this may be good or maybe not. So how does it work? Go does something that's called escape analysis. So if you compile your code with uh, gcflax-m, then uh, Go annotates your code basically and tells you sort of what's happening there. So here you can see in the, the second line, um, that uh, this num variable that we used was moved to the heap. And then in the next point, you see the bytes.reader, which represents our, our uh, io.reader escaped to the heap. So two times we see that something happened to the, or, or went to the heap. We don't exactly know what happened yet, but at least sort of there's proof that we have this, this kind of allocation problem. So what can we do? Well, we can simplify a bit. It turns out that the binary uh, or encoding binary package also has another method that looks like this, um, which is just called uin32 on the little endian uh, package. And it, it kind of does the same thing. You just put in the buffer on the one side. So no reader this time, you just put in the raw buffer basically with the, the position offset. And on the other side, you get the number out. And the crazy thing is this one line needs no memory allocations. So if we do that again, our 1 billion numbers that took 26 seconds before now take 600 milliseconds. So now we're starting to get into a range where like, this is acceptable for, data, for, uh, for databases. And uh, more importantly, what we see on that profile, the profile is so much simpler right now. There's basically just this one function there. Um, and and that, is, that is, yeah, it, it's what we wanted to do. So admittedly, we're not doing much other than parsing the data at the moment, but at least we got sort of rid of all the, the noise and um, you can see the, the speed up. Okay, so quickly to, to recap. Um, if we say a database is nothing but reading data and sort of parsing it to serve it to the user, then uh, we do that over and over again, then we need to uh, take care of memory allocations. And the fix in this case was super simple. We changed two lines of code and reduced it from 26 seconds to 600 milliseconds. But why we had to do that wasn't very intuitive. Like that wasn't very obvious. In fact, I haven't even told you yet why this binary read why that escaped to the heap. And in this case, it's because uh, we passed in a pointer and we passed in an interface. And that's kind of a, a hint, basically, that something might escape to the heap. So what I would wish is, yes, this is not a topic that you need every day you write Go. But maybe if you do need this, it would be cool if there was better education. OK, so second step, delayed decoding. So this is kind of the idea that we wouldn't want to do the same work twice. And we're sticking with our example of uh, serving data from disk. But now, while well, the number example was a bit too, too simple, so let's make it, make it uh, slightly more complex. We have this nested array here, basically um, a, a sort of slice of slice of u in 64. 
And that's representative now for a more complex object in uh, on, on your uh, database. Of course, in reality, you have like string props and other kind of things, but just sort of to show that there's more going on than a single number. And let's say we have 80 million of them, so 10 million of the outer slice, and then eight elements in each inner slice, and our task is just to sum those up. So these are 80 million numbers, and we want to know what is the sum of them. So that is actually kind of a realistic uh, uh, database task for, a, for an uh, uh, OLAP kind of database. Um, yeah, we need to somehow represent that data on disk, and we're looking at two ways to do this. Uh, the first one is JSON representation, and then uh, the second one would be some sort of binary encoding, and then, then, then there'll be more. So JSON is basically just here for completeness sake. We can basically rule it out immediately. So when you're building a database, you're probably not using JSON to, to uh, store stuff on disk unless it's sort of a JSON database. Um, why? Because it's space inefficient. So if you want to represent those numbers on disk, like space and ba uh, JSON basically uses strings for it, and then you have all these control characters, and you have like your curly braces and your quotes and your colons and everything. That takes up space. So in our fictional example, that would take up 1.6 gigabyte, and you'll see soon that, that we can do that more efficient. But also, it's, it's slow. And part of why it's slow is, again, because we have these memory allocations, but also the, the whole parsing just takes time. So in our example, uh, this took 14 seconds to sum up those 80 million numbers. And um, yeah, as I said before, you just don't have uh, double digit seconds in uh, a database. So we can do something that's a bit smarter, uh, which is called length encoding. So we're, we're encoding this basically as binary and we're spending one, uh, in, in this case, one byte. So that's basically a U and eight. And we're using that as a length indicator. So basically, that tells us that when we're reading this from disk, that just tells us what's coming up. So in this case, it says we have eight elements coming up. And then we know that our elements, in, in this example, is U and 32. So that's four bytes each. So basically, the next 32 bytes that we're reading are going to be our eight in an arrays. And then we just continue. Then we basically read the next length indicator. And, and this way, we can encode the stuff sort of in, in, uh, yeah, in one contiguous thing. Then, of course, we have to decode it somehow. And we can do that because we've, we've learned from our previous example, right? So we're not going to use binary little endian dot read, uh, but we're doing this in an allocation free way. Um, mm -hmm. You can see that in the length line, basically. And um, yeah, our goal is to take that data and put it into our nested sort of go slice of slice of slice of u in 64. And um, the, the code here, basically, you see we're reading the length and then we're increasing our offset so we know where to read from. And then we're basically repeating this for the, the inner uh, uh, slice, which is just hinted at here by the decode uh, inner function. So what happens when we do this? First of all, the good news, 660 megabytes, that's way less than our 1.6 gigabyte before. So basically just by using a more space efficient way to represent data, uh, we've yeah, done exactly that. We've, we've reduced our size. Also, it's much, much faster. So we were at 14 seconds before, and now it's down to 260 milliseconds. But this is our mad journey of building a database. So we're not done here yet because there's some hidden madness. And the hidden madness is that we actually spend 250 milliseconds decoding while we spend 10 milliseconds summing up those 80 million numbers. So again, we're kind of in that situation where we're doing something that we never really set out to do, like we wanted to do something else, but we're spending our time on, on um, yeah, on doing something that we didn't want to do. So where does that come from? And the first problem is basically that what we did, what we set out to do was fought from the get-go. Because we said we want to decode, so we're basically thinking in the same way that we're thinking uh, as we were with JSON. We said that we want to decode this entire thing into this Go data structure. But that means that you see we need to allocate this massive slice again. And that also means that we need to, in each inner slice, we also need to allocate again. So we're basically allocating and allocating over and over again, where our task was not to allocate, our task was to sum up numbers. So we can actually just simplify this a bit, and we can basically just not decode it. Like, while we're looping over that data anyway, instead of storing it in an array, we can just do with it what we plan to do. And in this case, um, this would be summing up the data. So basically, getting rid of that decoding step helps us to make this way faster. So now we're at 46 milliseconds. Of course, our, our footprint of the data on disk hasn't changed, because it's the same data that we're reading. We're just reading it in a slightly more efficient way. Um, but yeah, we don't have to allocate slices, and also because we don't have these like nested slices, we don't have like slices that basically have pointers to other slices, so we have better memory locality. And now we're at 46 milliseconds, and that is, that is cool. So 46 milliseconds is basically the time frame that can be acceptable for a database. 
Okay, so quickly, in recap, we immediately ruled out JSON because it just wasn't space efficient and we knew that we needed something more space efficient and also way faster. Binary encoding already made it much faster, which is great, but if we decode it up front, then yeah, we still lost a lot of time. And it can be worth it in these kind of high performance situations if you either sort of delay the decoding as late as possible until you really need it, or just don't do it at all, or do it in sort of small parts where we need it. Uh, no wish list here, but an honorary mention. So go 1.20. Um, they've actually removed it from the, from the release notes because it's so experimental. But go 1.20 has support for memory arenas. And the idea for memory arenas is basically that you can bypass the garbage collector and sort of manually free that data. So if you have something that you know has the same sort of life cycle, then you can say, okay, put it in the arena and basically in the end free the entire arena, um, which would sort of bypass the gar uh, garbage collector. So that could also be a solution in this case, um, if that ever makes it. Like right now it's super experimental and they basically tell you, we might just remove it, so don't use it. Third stop is uh, something that when I first heard it, almost sounded like too good to be true. So um, something called SIMD. I'll get to what that is in a second. But first, question to the audience. Who here remembers this thing? Raise your hands. OK, cool. So you're just as old as I am. Um, so this is the, the Intel Pentium 2 uh, processor. And this came out in the late 90s, I think 1997, and was sold for a couple of, couple of years. And back then, I did not build databases, definitely not in Go, because that also didn't exist yet. Uh, but what I would do was sort of try to play 3D video games. And I would urge my parents to, to get one of those new computers with an Intel Pentium 2 processor. And one of the arguments that I could have used in that discussion was, hey, it comes with MMX technology. And of course, I had no idea what that is. And it probably took me 10 or so more, uh, more years to find out what MMX is. Uh, but it's the first in a long list of SIMD instructions. I haven't explained what SIMD is yet, but I will in a second. Um, some of those, uh, especially the one in the, in the top line, they're not really used anymore these days, but the, the bottom line, like AVX2 and AVX512, you may have heard them. In, in fact, for, for many open source projects, they sometimes just sort of slap that label in the readme, like, yeah, yeah, has AVX2 um, optimizations, and that kind of signals you, yeah, we care about speed because it's like low-level optimized. And uh, VV8 does the exact same thing, by the way. So to understand how we could make use of that, um, I quickly need to talk about vector embeddings, because I said before that VV8 doesn't, doesn't search through data by keywords, but rather uh, through its meaning. And it uses vector embeddings as a tool for that. So this is basically just a, a long list of numbers, in this case floats. And then a machine learning model comes in and basically it says, do something with my input, and then you get this vector out. And if you do this on all the objects, then you can compare your vectors. So you basically can do a vector similarity comparison, and that tells you if something is close to, to one another or not. So for example, the query and the, the object that we had before. So without any SIMD, uh, we can use something called um, the dot product. The dot product is a simple calculation where basically you, use, uh, you multiply each element of the first vector with the same corresponding element of the second vector and then you just sum up all of those elements. And we can think of this like multiplication and summing as two instructions. So if we look out first, shout out here to the, the compiler explorer, which is a super cool tool to see like what your Go code uh, compiles to, we can see that this indeed turns into two instructions. So this is a bit of a lie because there's more stuff going on because it's in a loop, et cetera. But let, let's just pretend that indeed we have these two uh, instructions to multiply it and to, to add it. So how could we possibly optimize this even further if we're already at such a low level? Well, we can because this is our mad journey. So all we have to do is introduce some madness. And what we're doing now is a, a, a practice that's called unrolling. So the idea here is that instead of looping over one element at a time, we're now looping over eight elements at a time. But we've, gotten, we, we've gained nothing. Like this is, we're still doing the same kind of work. Like we're doing 16 instructions now in a single loop and we're just doing fewer iterations. So by this point, nothing gained. But why would we do that? Well, here comes the part where I thought it was too good to be true. What if we could do those 16 operations for the cost of just two instructions? Huh? Sounds crazy, right? Well, no, because SIMD, I'm finally revealing what the acronym stands for. It stands for single instruction, multiple data. And that is exactly what we're doing here. So we want to do the same thing over and over again, which is multiplication and then additions. And uh, this is exactly what these SIMD instructions uh, provide. So in this case, we can multiply eight floats uh, with other eight floats, and then we can add them up. So all is perfect here, maybe not. 
because there's a catch, of course, it's a mad journey. How do you tell Go to use these AVX2 instructions? You don't. You write assembly code because Go has no way to do that directly. The good part is that assembly code integrates really nicely into Go and um, in, the, in the standard library, it's used over and over again, so it's kind of a, a standard practice. And uh, there is tooling here, so shout out to Avo, really cool tool that helps you. Uh, basically, you're, you're still writing assembly with, uh, with Avo, but you're writing it in Go, and then it generates the assembly. So you still need to know what you're doing, but it's like it, it, it protects you a bit, so it definitely helped us uh, a lot. So, SIMD, recap. Um, using AVX instructions or other SIMD instructions, you can basically trick your CPU into doing more work for free, but you need to sort of also trick Go to use assembly. And with this tooling such as Avo, it can be better, but it would be even nicer if the language had some sort of support for it. And you may, may say, now, okay, this is this mad guy on stage that wants to build a database, but no one else does and uh, needs that. Uh, but we have this issue here that was open recently and unfortunately also closed recently because no consensus could be reached, but it comes up back and back basically uh, that Go users are saying like, hey, we want something in the language such as intrinsic. So intrinsics are basically the idea of having high level language instructions to do these, these sort of uh, AVX or, or SIMD instructions and C or C++ has that for example. One way to do that, and maybe you're wondering like, okay, if you have such a performance hot path, like why don't you just write that in C and use C Go or write it in Rust or something like that? Sounds good in theory, but the problem is that the call overhead to call C or C++ is so high that you actually have to outsource quite a bit of your code for that to, to pay off again. So if you do that, you, you basically end up writing more and more and more in that language and then you know, you're not writing Go anymore. So fortunately that's not, or it, it can be in some ways, but it's not always um, a great idea. So demo time. Um, this was gonna be a live demo and maybe it still is because I prepared this running nicely in a Docker container and then my Docker network just broke everything and it didn't work, but I just rebuilt it without Docker and I think it might work. If not, I have screenshots basically that, um, that do a backup. So example query here, I'm a big wine nerd. So what I did is I put wine reviews into VV8 and I wanna search them now. And one way to do it to show you basically that the keyword, um, that you don't need a keyword match, but can search by meaning is, for example, if I go for an affordable Italian wine. Let's see if the internet connection works. It does. So what we got back um, is basically this, this uh, wine review that I wrote uh, about a Barolo that I recently drank. And you can see it, it doesn't say Italy anywhere. It doesn't say affordable, what it says like without breaking the bank. So this is a vector search that basically happened in the, in the background. We can take this one step further by uh, using the generative side. So this is basically the, the chat GPT part. Um, we can now ask our database, based on the review, which is what I wrote, when is this wine gonna be ready to drink? So let's see, you saw before that was the failed query when the internet didn't work. Now, now it's actually working, so that's nice. Um, and here in this case, you can see that, so this is using OpenAI, but you can plug in other tools, can plug in open source uh, versions of it. Um, this is using OpenAI because that's nice to be hosted at a, at a service so I don't have to run the machine learning model on my laptop. And then you can see it tells you the wine is not ready to drink yet. We will need at least five more years, which is sort of a good summary of this. And then you can see another wine is ready to drink right now. It's in the perfect drinking window. So for the final demo, let's combine those two. Let's do a semantic search to identify something and then do an AI generation basically. So in this case, we're saying find me an aged classic Riesling, best, best wine in the world Riesling, um, and uh, based on the review, would you consider this wine to be a fruit bomb? So let's have sort of an opinion from the machine learning model in it. And um, here we got one of my favorite wines, and the, the model says, no, I would not consider this a fruit bomb. <laughs> While it does have some fruity notes, it is balanced by the minerality and acidity, which keeps it from being overly sweet or fruity. Which is, um, if you read the text, like this is nowhere in there, so this is kind of cool that the, that the model was, was able to do this. Okay, so let's go back. Now is the, the demo time. By the way, I have a GitHub repo with like this example so you can run it your, yourself and, um, and uh, yeah, try it out yourself. So this was our mad journey and are we mad at Go? Are we mad to do this? Well, I would pretty much say no because yes, there were a couple of parts where we had to go, uh, get really creative and had to do some, some yeah, rather um, unique stuff 
but that was also basically like the highlight reel of building a database and all the other parts, like it didn't even show the parts that went great, like concurrency handling and the, the powerful standard library. And of course, all of you basically representing the Gopher community, which is super helpful. And uh, yeah, this was my way to basically give back to all of you. So if you ever want to build a database or run into other kind of high performance problems, then maybe some of those examples helped you. And if you now want to try out VV8, you can see it on, on VV8.io or the GitHub is VV8 slash VV8. You can follow me on Twitter um, at uh, EtienneDI or um, you can follow VV8 at VV8.io. I don't have a Mastodon yet because that kind of seems to be the new thing, but I was busy writing assembly code, so <laughs> I had no time to create one yet. Um, yeah, that is our mad journey. Thank you very much. Can I have a round of applause? If you have, yeah, I see a question. I'll try to run towards you. I've been running all day, so it might be slow. Hi, um, thank you for your, for your uh, talk. Um, quick question about uh, compression. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, data size. Um, have you weighted the pros and cons between the compression to reduce the size and so the, the bandwidth needed to read the data and then yes. the penalty of decompressing? Yes, yes, absolutely. So basically the, the uncompressed example was sort of the, the simplified version because 25 minute talk and had to cut down. In real life, definitely compression, especially like using a UN64 in this example, most of the bits are probably gonna be zero so you can gain a lot from com uh, compression and. We have um, an inverted index also in, in VV8. Um, so we have these like kind of posting lists and they're very similar because they, they start from, from zero basically and go up. So there's lots of overlap and lots of gains to be made with compression. Um, yeah, maybe something for, for our mad journey part two. <laughs> yeah, so my first question is, uh, doesn't Go itself uh, leverage this SIMD things? It seems like it should, compiler should do these things. Uh, yes, it, it does um, and it does so sort of okay-ish. The problem is basically, um, typically with, with like the AVX uh, 512 where we wanted to do eight things at once, this is specific to some CPUs and the Go compiler doesn't, doesn't do it as well. Typically from the way that the Go compiler does it, I could get like a two times speed up, but never more, sort of never in the, the uh, yeah, sort of realms of eight times. But in general, and this is not so much a Go specific thing, like hand optimized uh, um, yeah, assembly or low level SIMD is most likely gonna be faster than what a compiler do simply for the fact that you know exactly what you wanna do, like how long is the data gonna be, this kind of stuff, whereas the compiler basically has to guess. And the second question is like, uh, did you try any other encoding like uh, something like, uh, there, there was something called group variant. I'm not sure we are using floats here, but there are other encoding algorithms which might save the space more. Like. Yeah, yeah, this goes in the same direction basically as the, the uh, compression question. So definitely more, this is sort of a, I don't want to say a fictional example, but it's sort of a simplified example for the, the purpose of a of slide. Okay, one last, um, yeah, sorry, we're running out of time. You can also see the hallway track.